your copy of God's Word and turn with me to the book of Ruth, Ruth chapter 2. I want to begin this morning by referring to a quote from one of the giant scholars of our day, the, the great Jimmy Johnson, former coach of the Dallas Cowboys. He was asked one time on a television program about luck and an athlete, how much of being an athlete is based on luck, and he made the following comment, hardworking, diligent, hustling players get lucky. And what he meant by that was that a lot of times the right guy in the right place at the right time is there because he hustled so much and good fortune just kind of fell into his hands. Most of you here this morning are old enough to remember this. Whether you do or not is another story altogether, but certainly uh, the guys will remember. It was December 23rd, 1972. The location was Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It was the AFC Divisional Playoff between the Oakland Raiders under legendary coach John Madden and the Pittsburgh Steelers with a future Hall of Fame quarterback named Terry Bradshaw. Do you know where I'm headed with this? Yeah, some of you do. The clock was ticking down. The score was 7-6 to six in favor of Oakland. Terry Bradshaw was under center. He rolls out, almost got sacked, uh, throws the ball down the field. Jack Tatum, who was a... Um, defensive um, guy for Oakland, uh, breaks up the play. The ball bounces off of his chest. Raiders think they've won, but out of nowhere comes rookie of the year, Franco Harris, who catches the ball just inches from touching the ground, not according to Oakland, but anyway, (laughs) and runs the ball in for a touchdown. Pittsburgh wins uh, that play has got its own name now. It is the Immaculate Reception. Exactly. (laughs) The question is, what was Franco Harris doing 15 yards down the field? When Terry Bradshaw threw the ball, he went above and beyond what a running back is supposed to do. A lot of times they'll stand back and just be a spectator to see whether or not the ball is caught. But he knew that if the guy does catch the ball, then he would need blockers downfield in order to score. And so Franco Harris um, not only throws his initial block, but he pursues the play on down the field. Um, And lo and behold, it happens once in a millennia that the ball gets tipped up uh, and the last play and lands in his hands at his ankles and he scores. It was Matthew Henry, the great commentator back in the 1700s, that said this, greatness is to a Christian like a shadow is to a person. The more you pursue greatness, the more it stays in front of you, but the more you sit back and take it easy, the more you retreat from pursuing greatness, the more it's like a shadow that follows at your heels. And that's what we're going to see here. Uh, Ruth is um, going to get marvelously blessed by God. Boaz is just going to show up out of nowhere and happen to ask the question, Who's the girl that's out there in my field? And they're going to say it's Ruth. And he's going to remember her character from previous conversations and earlier uh, days. And it's going to end up in this marvelous bestowing of physical blessing and social blessing. And in a time to come, great spiritual blessing. Of course, this isn't an exercise in luck, what we're seeing here. It's a demonstration of God's mighty providence. But I do want us... To notice Ruth's character during all of this. Incidentally, uh, could God choose to bless Ruth even if she had a horrible reputation? The answer is yes. God could choose to do that. We, we just came through the book of Judges and saw an awful lot of guys that didn't have a, a very good reputation. And God chose to, to bless them nonetheless. There's not a person here this morning that had a reputation. Nobody out there, not even the one talking to you, had a reputation that obligated God to bless them. Please remember that. Not a single one of us was God obligated to bless. Remember our study in the book of Judges, almost every single person we looked at was less than ideal. So don't misunderstand What I'm saying this morning, I am not saying that if you live a good moral life, that if you're honest, that if you're polite, that if you're hardworking, if you're nice to strangers, that God will save you from your sin and reward you with eternal life. That is not what I'm saying. That is what the world will tell you. 
If you will just be good enough, then God will save you because you have earned His favor. But that is not what I am telling you. That's what some in the church believe. But the Bible clearly teaches us the following. It is by grace that you and I have been saved, and it is through faith. This is not from ourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. God does not bless Ruth because she has good character. Follow me clearly here. This is very important. God does not bless Ruth because she has good character. That's not the lesson. What we need to remember is in chapter 1, we already saw Ruth come to place her faith and trust in God. In the God of Israel, in Yahweh, when she said, I'm going to follow you, Naomi. I'm going to follow your people and your what will be my what? Your God will be my God. She has already, for our purposes, Ruth is a Christian already at this point. So it is not her good character that brings her into salvation. What I want you to see today is that the character of someone who knows that their God is in control, who knows that their God is their reward, who knows that God is watching out for them, Ruth's character is the type of character that we should all desire to have. She is a standard for all of us recognizing what God has already done for us. So watch this. Ruth chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, says, Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. What that verse is telling us is that Naomi had a kinsman redeemer. Now the word kinsman redeemer... Um, In the Hebrew, the term goel does not appear in that verse. It does appear later in verse 20, but it does not appear in that verse. But what does happen in verse 1 is the defining of what a goel is, of what a kinsman redeemer is. A kinsman is simply someone that is related to you, usually someone fairly close. Uh, Down in the south, what term do we use? Kinfolk. Right? I mean, that's what we're talking about here. This is the kinsman redeemer. We're we're kinfolk. That's my kin over there, uh, is what we say. Um, In the Mosaic law, as outlined in Leviticus 25 and Leviticus 27, a kinsman redeemer was someone who would um, rescue, someone who would deliver, someone who would redeem property and people. So here's how it worked. It typically was spoken of in relationship to brothers, but it's not limited to brothers. It could be an uncle, it could be a cousin, some other close male relative, but it was, it was usually brothers. So let's just go with the illustration of brothers. Um, this is how it worked. If one brother died and left his wife as a widow, then it was the responsibility of the other living brother, even if he were already married, to take his sister-in-law as his wife, marry her, and raise a family on behalf of his deceased brother so that the name would continue and so that his sister-in-law, his now wife, would have people, family, to look after her as she got older and as they uh, came about. A kinsman redeemer would also redeem land and property that was about to be taken away from family. So if you found yourself in a situation, all sorts of circumstances, and your land was about to be taken away, a kinsman redeemer would come in and say, I'll pay for that land, and then I'll give it back to my family member. Now, I know in your head you're thinking, there's all sorts of loopholes there. Yes, I understand that, but that's what they were supposed to do. And it was a demonstration of what God had done for them. So do you see how if you're understanding it correctly, you're not going to take advantage of it because you're representing God. That's the kinsman redeemer. Naomi has this relative, this kinsman redeemer in Boaz. But notice that Ruth does not know this. Does God have a marvelous plan out there in the future for Ruth? The answer is yes. Does Ruth know what's about to happen? No. Does that apply to you and me? Yes, all the time. Kind of sounds like a cult. Yes, no, yes. 
God has plans that we know not of. And we just have to follow the light of His Word and be faithful. Folks, my life, your life, our lives have not been one of continual increase of blessing. There have been fits and starts, moments of growth and seasons of trial. God molding and shaping and then all of a sudden in His time and in His way, He will use us. I've told many of you this. Most of you know my background Prior to becoming your pastor, I spent 10 years in the insurance business. I started out with Allstate Insurance being trained to handle property and casualty claims. I worked as a claims representative for almost five years during that time, attending seminary and working on a master's degree. I took a short break of about 20 months. Um, It was good, humble work. I was working for my younger brother. Mm. 20 months working for a younger brother uh, starting his landscaping business. Uh, And then I went back into insurance working as a senior claims uh, manager for Canal Insurance Company. And all during that 12-year period, I was waiting for God to reveal how he wanted me to serve. And then it happened. My mom was working at the time for Janet and Steve Fuller, who many of you know are, are now members of Mountain Hill. They were not at the time. Um, and Janet and Steve had friends, still are friends, with Paul and Kitty, who you know are very uh, uh, good members here in our church. And through conversation, they found out that the church was looking for a pastor. And as they say, the rest was history. For nearly 12 years, though, I was working in the insurance business, managing conflicts, settling claims, working with attorneys. Sounds a lot like church, kind of. Um, and there were times... There were times that I wondered if God really called me to vocational ministry. God, I, this is 12 years now since graduating undergraduate. What, what's up? I thought you had called me to, to minister to your people. And yet I had to just be faithful. And at the right time and in the right place, God's plan was revealed. And this brings us to the first admirable character that we find in Ruth. She was polite. Look at verse 2. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And Naomi said to her, Go, my daughter. Ruth was polite. She asked her mother-in-law if it was all right for her to go and glean. She didn't wake up the next morning and say to herself, well, somebody's got to work around here or we won't eat. She went to her mother-in-law and sought out her permission to go among her mother-in-law's people. Remember, Ruth is a foreigner. She is in a foreign place and she doesn't want to just bust up into the marketplace acting like she's from there. Look at verse 7. This is after she's been in the field and Boaz comes along and begins to question his farm help and ask who she is. Notice how his servant responds. Well, she said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. What did she say? What's the first word of verse 7? Please. She's classy. There's a a great proverb found in the book of Proverbs. It goes like this. A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. And folks, that is not talking about your giftedness. That's not talking about your talent. That's a New Testament thing. It's not talking about your spiritual gift. That's a New Testament thing. This is talking about something that occurred in the Near East. In the Middle Eastern culture, whenever you were invited to someone's house, you always brought a gift. Many of you were taught that. Many of you have wine cellars at home that are full of other people's gifts to your, to your house. People bringing gifts to you. Uh, a little Bible trivia. Do you remember before Saul is made the first king of Israel, he's out looking for his daddy's lost donkeys. He takes a servant with him. He's out looking for them. They can't find the lost donkeys. His servant says, oh, we, I think we're in the neighborhood of the man of God. His name's Um, Samuel, why don't we go to him and see if he can help us find these donkeys? And Saul says in 1 Samuel chapter 9, But we, if we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is gone and there is no present to bring the man of God. What do we have? Listen, we had roughly 80 college students here Friday night and it was refreshing to see 
and hear those young people respecting one another and respecting their elders saying, thank you. Thank you for opening your church. Thank you for this dinner. Thank you for having us here. When they began to eat, and we had the prayer and said, y'all come on, kid you not, the guy said, ladies first. I turned to Larry Stokes and I said, hmm, that one hurt because none of us do that here. <laughs> ladies first, especially when it's ice cream, you know, get out of the way. <laughs> they were picking up their trash. They were taking other people's meals to them. And I know that there are a lot of bad bad manners out there today, but I am hopeful that in Christian homes and in Christian churches, we are still raising people, children who are polite and courteous. That leads us to the second character trait, and that is that Ruth was hardworking. Look at the end of verse 7. And so she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. He that is faithful in a little thing, how does it go? will be faithful with much. If you can't do the job of a reaper, if you can't do the job of a gleaner, then I doubt you're going to be very good at being the great-great-grandmother of the Son of God. I hope you took some time on Wednesday to pause and reflect on the events that took place 18 years ago on September the 11th. If you ever fly over the Statue of Liberty and look down at the top of her head, Lady Liberty's hair amidst her crown is a perfect hairdo. Um, Frederick uh, August Bartholdi, uh, the French sculptor responsible for her design, drew that up. Listen to this. He drew up the design for the Statue of Liberty before people were flying. Which tells you that any other man could, would have said, hey, let's give her a good face. Let's give her a good crown. Let's not worry about the top of her head. Ain't nobody going to see that. But that's not the approach that he took. Bartholdi said every single detail had to be perfect because it was a gift from France to the United States who had embodied the dreams of France of liberty, equality, fraternity, loyalty, the land of the free, the home of the brave, give me your refuse, all of that. And the idea was so marvelous to the French that you didn't compromise on your image of it. You and I represent the Son of God. Paul said, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks to the Father through Him. He would go on in that same chapter a few verses later and say, Whatever you do, doesn't even matter what you do. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Where does God have you right now? Where are you right now in your life? That might be your tuition to greater things. You have to bloom where you are before you can move on to other things. The Apostle Paul was a great tent maker before he was a great pastor and before he was a great missionary, but he had to start out as a tent maker first. Jesus was a carpenter before he went on his public ministry as the Messiah. But it continues. Look at verses 8 and 9. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. She's working hard. She's polite. She's classy. She handles authority well. And then all of a sudden, she's elevated. Our lives aren't a steady incline, and neither was Ruth. Folks, we labor unseen. We glean, and we get sunburned. We work, and we sweat where God puts us, wondering if there's anybody lower than us on the totem pole. Incidentally, being a Moabite gleaner is as low as you can get on the totem pole at the time. And within a sentence, her life is elevated. Such is the Christian life for you and me. God isn't going to be karma for us. Do you know what I mean by that? If I do these things, then God will spit out blessings to me. God is not a vending machine. You labor excellently as long as He tells you where you are and then let God put His charm on you. Third, Ruth was thankful. Look at verses 10 and 13. 
10 through 13. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Do you remember when Jesus healed the ten lepers in the New Testament? He healed all ten of them, but only one came back. Who was it? It was the Samaritan that came back. The others were all Jews, and they felt God was obligated to heal them because they were Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. He's the Messiah. We're Jews. Makes sense. But the Samaritan is absolutely blown away. He comes back and he falls at Jesus' feet. And Jesus ends that discourse with a lingering question. Were not ten healed? Where are the other nine? And the question is, are we like Ruth? Are we thankful for what God has done? God owes us nothing. It is only because of the great mercy displayed through Christ that any of us has a standing before a righteous God. We should be people marked by thanksgiving. That's why every prayer, every single prayer we pray ought to have some thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this place. Thank you for what you've given to us. Thank you. Verse 11 continues with these words, But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people you did not know. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant though I am not one of your servants. Ruth's reputation preceded her. The Bible says that Paul chose Timothy because he was of good repute among the brethren of Iconium and Lystra. In 1 Timothy and in Titus, one of the qualities of being an elder for the church is that you be of good reputation. All of these qualities that we've spoken about this morning, being polite, being a hard worker, being thankful, all go into the mix of her overall reputation. Proverbs 22.1 says, A good name is more desirable than great riches. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Ruth has a great name. She has a great reputation. And she has an excellent Character. Let me conclude this morning with this little story. Bill Gaither, the writer of the song that the choir just sang, Sinner Saved by Grace, wrote this story in a book he titled, I Almost Missed the Sunset. He said, Gloria and I had been married a couple of years. We were teaching at a school in Alexandria, Indiana, where I had grown up, and we wanted a piece of land where we could build a house. And I noticed the parcel south of town where cattle grazed, and I learned that it belonged to a 90-year-old banker named Mr. Yule. And he owned a lot of land in the area, and the word was that he would sell none of it. He gave the same speech to everybody who asked. I promised the farmers they could use it for their cattle. Gloria and I visited at the bank, and although he was retired, he spent a couple of hours each morning in his office, and he looked up over the top of his bifocals. I introduced myself and told him that we were interested in a piece of his land, and he said, not selling. Promised it to farmers for their grazing. I know, but we teach school here and thought maybe you'd be interested in selling it to someone planning to settle in the area. He pursed his lips and stared at me. What would you say your name was? Gaither. Bill Gaither. Hmm. Any relation to Grover Gaither? Yes, sir. He was my granddad. Mr. Yule put down his paper and removed his glasses. Interesting. Grover Gaither was the best worker I ever had on my farm. Full day's work for a day's pay. So honest. What did you say you wanted? I told him again. Let me do some thinking on it and then come back and see me. Bill Gaither said, I came back within the week and Mr. Yule told me that he had, he had had the property appraised. I held my breath. How does 3,800 sound? Would that be okay? <coughs> If that was per acre, I'd have to come up with nearly $60,000. Uh, 3800 I repeated. Yep, 15 acres for $3,800. I knew it had to be worth at least three times that, and I readily accepted. Nearly three decades later, my son and I strolled that property. Beautiful, lush, had once been pasture land. Benji, I said, you've had this wonderful place to grow up. 
through nothing that you've done, but because of the good name of a great granddad you never met. Now, I suspect that many of us could tell a similar story about our own family names or deals or arrangements or doors that had been opened um, solely because of the name and the reputation of someone that we knew. But here's the real question. How many of us are getting into the heaven, getting into heaven because of our reputation? Not a single one. We are getting in on the name of Jesus Christ. We are getting in because of His great name and because of His great reputation. Let us pray.